our second speaker uh, this afternoon, uh, the second, our second session, uh, is Dr. Nora Rowley. Uh, Dr. Rowley is a physician, human rights activist, and an alumna at Harvard University. While, uh, while working in Burma, uh, she was transformed after witnessing human rights violations uh, and brutal persecution of Rohingya Muslims uh, and the Rohingya's peaceful dignity in the face of inhumanity. Uh, upon return to the United States, she has worked to increase her own and others' understanding of the human rights situation in Burma, uh, especially the fight of the Rohingya. Uh, through work and independent and formal study for a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins, uh, she has worked to improve the human rights, health, and well-being of vulnerable populations, including refugees and survivors of torture, severe human rights violations, and domestic abuse. Uh, the title of Dr. Rowley's presentation is uh, Rohingya Muslims Terrorized for Decades in Burma Under or Relevant Authoritarian Rule. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rowley back to the University of Illinois. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Assalamu alaikum. Minglaba. <laughs> All right, so um, I am a human rights physician. So that's the perspective I'm taking on this. And um, we get a little evidence uh, and picture oriented. So uh, uh, if I, there will be photos that I expect objection to, but they're, they're part of my presentation as a human rights physician. All right, to start out with, okay, I'm really trying to say, how did Burma get to the authoritarian rule of today and the uh, anti-Muslim uh, uh, ideology and actions of today? That's my purpose. Which one of these boys is Rohingya? Why has it gone from overt brutal persecution of Rohingya, where you could still protect your daughter, to overt ethnic cleansing since June, where your daughter dies of starvation. How do giggly girls grow up to carry weapons? What society? And, you know, just to get a taste of what Burma is about and how it developed. George Orwell, he had it right, just in these two books. The Development of Burman Authoritarian Rule. You have to go back to, first of all, before, before it was uh, a part of British uh, India. Um, uh, it was separate, separate kingdoms, <coughs> uh, tribes, areas, territories. The boundaries of today's Burma were drawn by the British. They collected through various wars, uh, the three wars, um, what is now today's Burma. Pre-colonial area, there was a Burman kingdom, central area, dominant, um, aggressive, and uh, they had captured a couple of kingdoms, including the Arakan kingdom in 1784. And there are the independent tribes, territories, and kingdoms more in the periphery border area of today's Burma. British colonial uh, uh, Burma, British India colonial um, era, the first wave was in 1824 when Arakan, uh, Arakan uh, became part of it. Um, British ruled through divide and conquer. And uh, the British, as well as the Indian administrators, were very much more familiar with the culture of Muslims, and uh, they, be, uh, they were preferred in the Arakan less so, and that created tensions. Uh, Arakan was already an uh, uh, agricultural <coughs> area, and the British helped develop that further, as well as Sitwe was a fishing fishing village and they turned it into a deep, uh, I don't know if it was deep seaport then, but a seaport is one of the major exporters of rice in the world. Okay, talk to many people from Burma, what's been handed down 
from the colonial area. Is both the British and Indians racist? There was brutality. Um, Burmans were subject, were quite subjugated. Um, they had been the area dominant and under British colonial rule, they were very subjugated. Uh, whereas the border areas of uh, subpopulations were given more autonomy, not complete, but some more autonomy. They're, all, uh, they're allowed to have roles in the colonial administration and army as well. What are the seeds? What are the rational events that happened that have led to um, the anti-Muslim um, ideology in Burma. Well, you go from a, a, a population with some believing of Burmy, Burman supremacy. They uh, uh, are the pure and then they are subjugated. So anybody that subjugates them is, uh, is, is resented. And of course it wasn't just British colonial, it was British Indian colonial. So Indians came in as administrators, and as administrators um, of colonial rule, um, they, um, uh, and also uh, there's a resentment of being sub subjugated to them, but also um, the feeling of uh, Burmans that felt that they were superior pure, uh, <coughs> looking at the Indians of being impure, and looking at them in a xenophobic eye. I'm not saying it's everybody, but <coughs> these are factors. Well, there are Indian money lenders that went into Burma uh, with the development from the British and um, did a lot of uh, uh, <clears throat> mortgaging of property. Um, a lot of money was lent with the land as collateral. Uh, most of the Indian money lender lenders actually were Chetlers, which is a Hindu caste. Uh, they're from southern India, so they have darker skin. Um, in post-1900, there was a progressive economic decline and many people defaulted on their loans. There was some corruption in there too, but most of it was defaults on loans because of the economic decline. There's a lot of land loss. From my time in Burma on, this is the, one of the biggest complaints about Muslims. Muslims took our land. Muslims took our land. Well, in the 1920s, there started to be, um, from rural to urban areas, there started to be um, anti-Indian um, activity, uh, riots, um, and soon um, the activity started uh, targeting the mosques, especially when, uh, when India was reaching independence, more Indians went back to India proper. Um, but um, the ones left behind, especially in Arakan, uh, more, more stayed there. The um, majority of the ones that stayed were Bengalis. There are Hindus there, but um, mostly Bengalis of the ones that were um, in Burma from India. World War II, uh, the divisions uh, that were created by the British also um, divided who fought with who, who. The Rohingya fought with the British, and not every single, uh, uh, not every single Rohingya fought, um, and not every single Ro uh, Arakan Buddhist fought with the um, Burman and Japanese forces. Um, there were uh, large civilian casualties on both sides. 239 villages were depleted of Muslims. The Pangalong visions. Well, the resentments from what had happened before, but also during World War II with the casualties. Um, with the Burman, the Burman forces, um, uh, there was a tremendous amount of rejection of being under Burman dominant rule. So um, Aung San, General Aung San, the father of, Gen uh, of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, she, uh, he basically uh, very much wanted an inclusive uh, Burma, um, um, and uh, he had a conference at Penglong Shan State, um, and they drafted up uh, an agreement. Uh, most of them agreed to be part of this uh, new Burma as long as they had some autonomy at the state level, um, equal rights and representation. So a federalist union like the United States with a central government, but some governance at the state level as well. Well, um, General Aung San was uh, assassinated, and so was that Panglong vision. 
1948 Constitution had no equal rights for minorities, no state-level autonomy. Um, both Eric and Buddhists as well as Rohingya um, formed opposition. Both political parties as well as militias wasn't everybody in it, um, but opposing Burman dominant rule. Military coup 1962 established military dictatorship and Burman military authoritarian rule. General Ne Win came in um, and he very much had a, a belief that he was a Burman's uh, supreme leader. Um, he was the judge of purity um, and he was known to be very xenophobic. Um, you could be Buddhist, but as long as you're not Burman Buddhist, you still uh, were not of the pure race. Um, one party, only one political party was allowed, uh, dissolved all the one, formed another one. Only the Arak and Buddhists were invited to be in it, not the Rohingya. Very anti-intellectual, very anti-critical thinking, uh, very much uh, obedient, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, obedience rather than critical thinking was uh, what uh, Nguyen was looking for. Very isolationist and, and definitely anti-Muslim. This is the, um, the words used to describe what the rule was. Um, they call it socialism, but it very much Soviet style. General oppression. In Arakan, the oppression was there, and it is there today. Um, dismantling the, the education system, um, um, imposed impoverishment, um, and um, to create both dependence um, as well as a system in which information can be controlled, censored, propaganda, um, decreasing education, and through all this, basically, it's very easy to have an indoctrination system into um, uh, very much a 1984, where um, the only information you're getting is what the state is controlling in many different um, ways. And definitely, like 1984, uh, Big Brother, people watching, um, and informants, and as we you know see here today, uh, the Bangladesh, uh, Burma may be very far away, um, but the regime has been in rule since '62. So they have uh, people um, doing their arguments for them um, all over the world, and targeting the Muslims uh, from the beginning. Uh, the socialism, um, they didn't do anything for the people um, as, as far as um, social services uh, except taking them away. But they did nationalize the businesses, land, banks, and the Rohingya lost big time here. They lost from the very beginning, they lost businesses and land. Um, you know, uh, within one to two years after dictatorship rules started, uh, there was orders for movements restrictions uh, of the Rohingya, not, not the uh, uh, other people. Um, the community organizations were banned, um, and when Arakan um, governance was um, drawn up, the only Rakhine um, interchangeable, this is the old ancient word, and this is the state as well, sometimes are people, people, um, um, Rakhine Buddhists were the ones that were in um, <clears throat> control, and definitely, definitely uh, developing the anti-Muslim propaganda through the media, through the military schools, um, I've talked to people that have been in the military. Um, I've talked to Buddhist monks, um, and I've talked to people in the public school system that were exposed to regime anti-Muslim propaganda. Creation of enemies. This is very, very key in Burma, not just for the Rohingya. Um, who, uh, when you control the media, control people's information, um, it's easy, the hardships, the oppression is blamed on the enemies of the state. Not just enemies of the state, but enemies of the people in the state. Um, so that's why it's necessary to have military protection. Um, and uh, this is done very well through the uh, information control and propaganda. Um, Divisions, uh, you know, divide and rule, divide and conquer. You know, I don't know if they uh, had done it before British rule, but they certainly have worked on it here. Uh, where the divisions nationally, uh, you know, if you, uh, 
I've read from a couple of people and talked to a couple of people that that lived in their different areas, but they went to university, university and uh, were able to interact with uh, with other students from um, the other cultures that had been deemed the enemy. And uh, they were very enlightened to find out that they had the same aspirations. And it was uh, this portrayal as different people, as the enemies um, and as evil, um, that they um, came to understand for what the regime was doing. Um, but also through these divisions on a national and local level, they uh, recruited allies. They may, they may have been uh, peripheral areas that were against a Burman, uh, Burman rule, um, but um, they, uh, through the divisions and um, people getting preference, uh, populations getting preference, it certainly um, had at least, uh, um, they could uh, manipulate them that way. Mistrust, mistrust is, is really fervent in Burma. Um, and they've even gotten to the point with the informants and that, that even within own communities, there's a tremendous amount of distrust at times. Xenophobia, basically through the creation of enemies, is, is unfortunately uh, rife in Burma. All opposition is crushed, um, and through the opposition, uh, military political activities um, by the late 70s, uh, the regime really wanted it, wanted it stopped. So they um, started, a, um, they started uh, um, targeting civilians in areas with opposition. There was the four cuts policy where they cut food funds, intelligence, as well as recruits. Um, and uh, um, <clears throat> part of this, uh, when they went to Arakan, even though there were a couple of Arakan militias, um, um, they only targeted the Rohingya with this campaign. Extremely violent. There was a mass exodus to Bangladesh. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Bangladesh government purposely <coughs> gave inadequate food to the Rohingya. Um, the death rate was not, uh, not it, that Bangladesh's death rate in 1978 was the gold standard, but it uh, went from twice, um, twice the uh, Bangladesh uh, death rate in June of 78 to by November 17 times. Um, at the same time, they were starving the refugees. Um, they uh, got into no negotiations with the Burmese regime. Um, and the ruling military said, oh, they're illegal Bengalis that got into Burma, or they really just are not even in front, uh, step foot in Burma. They're just Bengalis that want to get some, um, some uh, refugee relief. They're not Burmese. Uh, well, they refuted their own argument when they eventually did take them back. In 1982, uh, the citizenship law was enacted that uh, stripped um, Muslims of, uh, and specifically Rohingya, of their, um, of their citizenship and rendered them stateless. And this is, uh, even though there were persecutions and human rights, uh, persecution and human rights abuses before, it certainly, certainly intensified it. Um, basically, the, the Burma population, as well as other minorities at the university level, they saw the regime for what they were doing ever since '62. There were peaceful protests that the regime put down with uh, real, quite uh, real brutality. Um, but in 1988, in August, um, there were students anywhere from elementary students all the way up to university and beyond in peaceful pro-democracy uh, protests. And uh, one day, the um, they regime military uh, took machine guns and, and killed a bunch of, uh, I think, up to 20 eight to nine-year-olds. And that got around the country. And so the people started rethinking what the regime's narrative is versus reality. Well, that got out to the world. And it got uh, score a lot of attention. The regime didn't want any attention like that. So one of, the, one of their um, great propaganda, starting in 1990, is the uh, roadmap to democracy. But they made sure that roadmap included a constitution, which sounds very democratic, but that, uh, that constitution includes that the Burmese military would ta take a leading role in the national politics. So keep that in mind when <clears throat> they're talking about the democracy right now and the fact that 25% of the parliament um, has to be, by constitution, has to be held by the military. Well, at the same time, they're starting this uh, 
this uh, narrative of democracy, uh, they're crushing opposition throughout the country. Berman, people that took place in the pro-democracy, um, uh, peaceful protests, as well as people they had already targeted before, and this included the Rohingya. So there was another violent campaign, another uh, mass exodus to Bangladesh, another mass repatriation back, but with this happening for a sec time right after all the, the big uh, uprisings with the students, um, they, uh, UNHCR and some of the NGOs were able to negotiate a presence in Rakhine. Um, just to let you know where we're talking about, this is Rakhine State right here. This is northern uh, Rakhine where most of the Rohingya have lived. Uh, certainly uh, with these <clears throat> with these areas, uh, when I was there in 2006, that's where most of them live. The mouth of the Knapp River here, eight kilometers wide, five miles, not too far apart. It gets very narrow. So you can see how how both the sea and by land, um, it is a natural place to flee uh, when you or your life is uh, being threatened. So progressively, human rights abuses and per persecution has gotten worse. The Burmanization has been mentioned a couple times before, the model homes where they dilute Muslims, uh, the amount of Muslims decrease the percentage of of them bring in Burmans. Um, also in the mid 90s, there was another campaign in the opposition areas to bring people from the rural areas into the, uh, the urban. And um, in uh, uh, one of the third most populous of uh, Rohingya um, the townships, basically it went from 53 to three Muslim villages in a five year period of time. Also in, late, uh, in 1997, the regime enacted a troop uh, self-reliance um, initiative where basically um, the regime did not furnish any food and it didn't furnish money for food. So there already had been um, human rights and, uh, violations and other problems uh, uh, before, but this certainly increased food theft, forced farming, land confiscation of farmland, um, and arbitrary taxation. Um, and the anti-Muslim violence in 2001 started in February um, and in Sitwe, it was communal violence. Uh, many of them um, were, uh, uh, the Korean Human Rights Group did a really, really good report. Um, and they talked about how the, um, um, the uh, there was widespread allegations that there had already had been military in intelligence officers that had infiltrated uh, monasteries to make sure there was not any anti-regime activity. And the, um, uh, there were multiple, uh, multiple uh, initial incidents of these violent, uh, uh, riots uh, and communal violence um, in Burma involving Muslims uh, had monks with them. So we don't know if they're real monks or military intelligence. But um, an open letter from Ashan Gambira. Um, who was uh, one of the people behind the Saffron Revolution, monks step at, uh, standing up for impoverished people, peacefully protesting. Um, but he basically said, as a uh, young Buddhist uh, novice, uh, young monk and monks, um, basically the military intelligence was able to get them anti-Muslim uh, anti propaganda. Um, uh, so that may be why there were monks, real monks, that are protesting now. Population control um, in so many different ways. When I was there, um, another um, expat, basically uh, what the mil military commander said, you know, how do we get them to not have so many children? It's as if they're trying to take over. Well, you know, that's... That's the belief of what they're trying to do uh, by too many, um, and uh, and you know, uh, Walker's already mentioned that the marriage permits are are required, very high cost, very few can get them, um, and they're often delays for years, um, and so this is very much a way of controlling, making them ju jump through hoops, is uh, and make the hoop higher and higher and out of reach, and the penalties for marriage without permit are severe. Birth restrictions, um, initially in 2003, it was officially written on the books that they could have no more than three children, 
and when, uh, when I was there in 2006, it went down to two. The health department is the least fun uh, funded department in Burma, and family planning was the only thing they avidly uh, uh, came out to, to give the Rohingya, but they, they knew what they were doing. And uh, it was very hard for us for our program. We had a nutrition program, so we wanted to do birth spacing. Um, it was very hard to convince them that we weren't uh, uh, wanting them to do this for population <coughs> control. We wanted them to have babies, but healthy babies and the rest of the family. I wasn't there two, three weeks. And I, I how many men came up to me and said this to me. They're living in a prison. It's closing in, suffocating us more and more every day. I saw uh, the oppression of the Rakhine Buddhists. They did not have an easy life. Poverty was all over. The military wasn't nice to them. They were just not as bad to them. But the legal status has really, really hit the Rohingya. They are at best foreign residents. And with that excuse, everything they have to do, they have to get permission for. And that permission is money, is denial, delay. The bottom line is control. Stripping these people <coughs> of dignity and control of their life. That is it. The family list is their um, legal document. And the photo is to coordinate the, the, the faces with the names on the list. And it is absolutely, absolutely you. Uh, corrupted, uh, used for extortion, everything, um, you know, to get them to do what the regime wants. Travel restrictions, you have to have a travel permit to uh, um, get outside your village. Um, if you, the further you go, the more money, the higher levels of permission you need. Um, the barriers, uh, barriers to health care, barriers to jobs, barriers to education, um, many things because of the uh, delays uh, that are not accidental in um, the travel permissions. Checkpoints, even though you have a travel permit, Rakhine don't need a travel permit. They, uh, Buddhists, they just sail through. Burmese are harassed, there's violence, uh, asking for more money, turning back, even for, for there's an understanding that for health related emergencies, um, you know, they would try to get permits, but if the person wasn't around, to get the permit they could get through, they were still turn, turned back. I would go out to the field and hear from people that they, you know, carrying, carrying their sick mother, carrying whatever, and, you know, got to the checkpoint and they were turned away. And then they tried to get the travel authorizations, but it was, uh, um, and it sounds very much like uh, Palestine. You hear about the p women in childbirth, and this definitely happens. Security of person, the violence, is so, so common. There is an atmosphere of terror. Throughout Burma, where the military goes, brutality follows. It's documented over and over and over again. Detention, um, in detention, torture is the rule rather than the exception. Forced labor is brutal. Um, the amount of work they do, the inhumane treatments you get, and um, rape is a weapon of persecution, and it is common. It is very, very common. Muslim women are sequestered for religious reasons, but a lot of that has to do with protection from being raped. And it's a huge barrier for girls to get to high school. In the Mungdo Township, there's only one high school miles away so there has to be a male family member old enough to defend her that can routinely go with her each way to school. Um, and so in that way, very few Rohingya girls are able to go to high school. Arbitrary taxation, any way to get any money and control. It's, it's income for the military. Permits, registrations, structural property. If you want to repair your roof, you have to get permission. And that permission is money. Your tree from your official income harvest or your personal harvest. If you just happen to have a mango tree, your kind Buddhist neighbor, 
fine. They can eat whatever. If you're a Rohingya, you're taxed on the mangoes that grow on your tree. If you have food animals, you have chicken that has chicks, you're taxed on the chicks, not your neighbors. Essential services, uh, education, health care um, that are free. There's always a booklet fee, registration fee, a fix the fence fee, a fix the roof fee. Everything, just nickeling and diming them. Arbitrary and false arrests are done um, to get people to pay a bribe in order to get out of the pun uh, of going into detention, which is associated with a tremendous amount of brutality. Forced labor, um, it is unfortunately quite common and it has not changed at all in Rakhine despite claims otherwise in the rest of the country. Um, used to um, upgrade, maintain military camps used for portering, um, and the portering is one of the most feared. Um, I uh, met a man who at the age of 14, his father was taken for forced labor, and they're claiming a mountain with portering, and his father, um, I don't know if he became ill or injured, but or just couldn't push, uh, keep up, he was pushed off the side of the mountain and killed. Um, and that is not an uncommon story. Unfortunately, infrastructure, roads, bridges, regime development. There's a big association with development and forced labor. Uh, detention, people are taken from detention and used as forced labor. Sometimes when you hear about a lot of uh, arbitrary uh, detention going on, uh, you wonder what project's going on that they need uh, unpaid labor for. It's unpaid, like I said, brutal. And when the head of the household man is doing forced labor, who's at home protecting the family? Who's doing the farming for food or income generation? And this is not just the Rohingya, it's, it's, it's in the, the border areas in, in some central too. Land confiscation is devastating, it's forced eviction, sometimes it's not, it's just the farmland, um, it's not necessarily where they live, but most of the time it's where they're living, displacement, the model villages like a um, uh, said, said before, and they find, uh, especially in the violence now, they're finding that a lot of the uh, Burmans that are uh, brought in for these model villages are, are active participants in the violence against the Rohingya. Um, land confiscation, big association between land confiscation and uh, the regime needing the property for some money making and political associated uh, development. Um, a lot of, large amount of internal displacement and of course, loss of income, social support, and uh, personal security are problems associated with it. Barriers to education from the very, very beginning. The costs, the arbitrary as well as official costs, few teachers, corrupt, corruption. UNICEF will donate books. Uh, they're donated, they're free. The teachers uh, will not give them out unless there's a donation given to her. Uh, not all the time, uh, but it does happen. Um, um, and sometimes teachers just don't show up. Um, tremendous amount of discrimination. Um, very few high schools, like I said, in Mungdo uh, Township, there's only one high school. Um, and I had multiple Rohingya tell me that um, their children were forced to learn Buddhism and were um, um, tested on it in the government school system. The si in Sitwe University, TA, you have to get, it, they will accept money for courses. Um, you have to get a travel authorization. They will accept money when you apply for it. It will come um, a halfway, two thirds the way through the um, semester, through the term, um, uh, the TAs, uh, and so you've missed most of the course. Um, and I know, I know so many of the guys that applied again and, and again and again for the travel <coughs> authorizations, for their summary exams, to get their diploma and it comes the day after, or not at all. Uh, one guy, it took him four times uh, to finally get his diploma. For the few that are able to you know, get through all the different barriers, and one of the biggest barriers is the horrendous, horrendous poverty um, and what happens when the father's taken away for forced labor or taken under arbitrary detention. So um, they are needed for caretaking for their younger siblings, um, 
um, income generation, food generation. So the barriers to education are, uh, it's very, very hard uh, to surmount them for the Rohingya. Now, that's not saying that the school system is great for the Rakhine, but they don't have, they don't have as many barriers up. Um, and just think about it, if there's one high school, you have to get travel authorizations and you have to go through checkpoints. It's very expensive, not just the cost of school, getting there. And, and, and while traveling, the violence and taking uh, for forced labor is, is rife. So there's a tremendous amount of risk in, in travel. Barriers to health care, um, distance, huge, huge. And then travel costs, permit, um, and the dangers. Um, cost is huge. It's fee for service, and um, the fee, uh, like I said, the free services, there's a national TV program. Uh, sometimes they'll have arbitrary registration fees that are not bad, but uh, I've, uh, sometimes the fees are, uh, for registration fees are uh, quite high, just unaffordable. So it's a way of turning away someone from services without turning them away. Discrimination, both interpersonally um, uh, as well as medically. Um, the amount of malpractice I saw there toward our patients was horrible, toward the, uh, toward the Muslim patients, the, not the Buddhists. The Buddhists um, were treated all right. Um, and some dangerous practices. The reuse of needles in Burma is widespread by skilled as well as unskilled health professionals. And um, it can be quite, quite scary. Um, corruption, uh, basically we, uh, anybody that goes to the hospital where we're at, um, they had to bring their own pillows, blankets, uh, food, um, and if the hospital needed any supplies, bandages, uh, IVs, needles, drugs, um, then the family had to get it. With us, we furnished it for our patients, and we were finding from parents as well as our hospital liaison um, that the, um, what we were furnishing to the hospital for our patients' care was not ending up in our patients' care. Whether it was being sold, used on someone else, I don't know. But the corruption was rife. Um, and if I ever protested, um, basically they said, well, we just won't see your patients anymore. And they had done that with the previous medical officer. They would refuse our patients. Like I said, travel is a huge barrier, and they are the least funded department in Burma. Religious persecution um, is not just a Muslims. Christians in Chin State, uh, uh, Chin, Chin State are very much persecuted. Um, religious leaders are targeted. Mosques, madrasas are damaged, ruined, uh, or just closed. They won't allow them to open. They have to get permits for celebration. Permits are money, delays, control. Eat sacrifice animals are stolen. Um, bought up a couple months ahead of time in huge profiteering off of that. Um, and uh, we had a couple incidences where we would go into villages to do our clinics and uh, it was soon after the regime came in to do family photos. And there uh, were a number of incidences that, that came to us where the women wearing the hijab scarves uh, were slapped right in front of their husbands to take the scarf off. And the regime knows who they're dealing with, and they know, I mean, any husband's not going to be happy with it, but they, they understand the Muslim culture and the, the belief of duty to God to protect the women. So that's a way of persecuting the man as well as the women. Well, while everything's getting worse in Rakhine for Rohingya, the rest of the country, the poverty is... is uh, extensive, um, and the regime through propaganda, through creation of enemies, has had their excuses, um, and, and they say, well, you need to make your sacrifice, uh, we don't have much money. Um, this is uh, the dictator's daughter, wedding photo. I don't know how she walks, she's le uh, le uh, letting down with the, the diamonds on her. Well, they put this on, on the state newspaper. It did not go over well. 
This is the Saffron Revolution, 2007. Peacefully protesting, this is the result. Really open the eyes for a regime that claims to be pious foods. Cyclone Nargis. It hit. Who is in charge of Cyclone Nargis relief for the regime? The current president. He was General Thing saying right here. So big photo ops, nice photo ops with subjugated uh, um, uh, masses. Waiting long lines, relief was finally allowed in. Good quality rice packaged up, sent to Bangladesh. Moldy, rotten rice fed to people waiting days, if not weeks, for an, an ounce of food. Toad to see, a couple people mentioned this 2009. It happened before, and it's still happening today. They're human trafficked, <coughs> they know it. They have no choice. Boats are not given adequate fuel. They run out, drift into waters of Thailand. They're arrested, beaten. Um, while they were held for a couple weeks, the Thai authorities had their engines taken off the boats. They towed the boats to the sea. Um, and out of 1,000 in the, uh, December, January 2009, um, of 1,000 people that got on the boats, 400 survived. Uh, they were uh, landed, brought to Indonesia, and initially the UNHCR um, was denied access to them for a couple weeks. Do not, uh, like this right here, the natural resources and the political connections. Do not um, overlook how much power the regime has in the region because of their energy resources and their connections. Um, so finally they, sorry, finally they uh, were allowed in um, the regime when they had talks about taking them back, sure, if they can prove their citizens. Okay, so supremacists, whether you're Burman supremacist, not every Burman is. Um, Aryan, white supremacists, same narrative over and over again. How do you, how do you um, inspire violence, fear? Um, how do you gain control through that? How do you get people to do your violence for you? Oh, invasion. Oh, they're invading. So that's the, the narrative from Bangladesh and other Muslims from Bangladesh. They're going to take over. Secret infiltrating, very clever line. I was told that there, uh, I would have military guys come up to me and say, oh, well, their nutrition is bad because they're low education. I don't know how many people were trying to tell me they're low education and that they don't care about education. Well, and then, okay, which one are you going to have? Are they clever or are they uneducated and stupid? Forced conversion. Street, they're going to be violent. They're violent. Muslims are innately violent. They're going to rape your women. And they're intolerant of any other religion. This is the narrative I've heard. It's not everybody, but this is what I've heard over and over and over again of, um, of the supremacist propaganda that the people are talking about. Oh, the Muslims, oh, this is what they're going to do. And believe me, I lived there um, several, several months, and uh, it was to the contrary. Who sees the loving sisters? Both sides. You know how many people from Burma have looked at my pictures and like, oh, oh, she's, she's dirty, whatever. It's like, well, it, I'm actually, the difference I see is that she's worried, and I don't know how old this baby is, but uh, he looks really sick. But they're both loving sisters. This is what's going on. I'm sorry, this is graphic. This is what's going on now. Communal violence, but disproportionately, the victims, the displaced, are the Muslim population. Most of them are Rohingya Muslims. So the violence, this is the, this is the um, solution um, to um, put barbed wire around the Rohingya that are displaced and forcibly re relocated. Um, um, men rounded up, 
um, children killed and um, imprisoned, uh, people in prison tortured. These are the numbers from uh, uh, UNHCR in late June. These are the areas that have um, um, internally displaced, uh, the far majority of them are in Sitwe. What's going on in Sitwe? Why Sitwe? This is the latest. Same thing, uh, forced eviction by arson and, and violence, disproportionately affecting the Rohingya and other Muslims. Flee to sea, not allowed by immigration. Where they're at the shore, they're awaiting UN and other NGOs with relief for them. They're not allowed to get on shore. When they finally get on shore, this is their encampment, her baby's dead, or you come ashore in other ways. I may have, this is four years ago. I uh, made this up about the international development that's going on in the time. Are there other reasons? Are there other things going on that this is happening now? Look at all the energy, oil and gas in Burma. Tremendous amount of power, uh, uh, financial, geopolitical for the regime. Tremendous amount of power for the neighbors, not necessarily the people in uh, energy power uh, for the people. So China's building two pipelines. There's inland oil and, uh, and gas and then offshore um, oil. These are the pipelines, um, oil and gas, through the country, starting off with Pine, um, into China. These are the military battalions, and the, the gray, um, gray and orange are the battles between the uh, Burman, uh, Burma's uh, military and locals um, since March 2011, when, quote, democracy was uh, installed into Burma. This is the beginning of the two pipelines in Rami Island. This is Chok Pu. This is where one of the uh, Muslim quarters was attacked. And the military, regime military in this area. This is Sitwe. This is the city of Sitwe. And this is a deep sea port being built by India. And there's also um, going to be development along here for commercial market for India. Kalina River runs from India, Chin State, uh, Chin State all the way down through um, uh, northern Rakhine, uh, where the, most of the Rohingya live. Uh, there's going to be a shipping channel uh, from here to here a road built there, and it's going to connect to the deep sea port, and there still may be, uh, there still may be um, um, a, a pipeline. There's a possibility of being, building a pipeline because uh, India has the rights to natural gas that's offshore. So what's the response right now? Internationally, you know, there's rumors, oh, we think citizenship will make every effort to have peace and stability without in outside interference and uh, return to normal. What's happening in um, internally? Well, President Thing saying send an order out to have an operation where they want to track down illegal Rohingya. By their rules, all Rohingya are illegal. But basically starting today, they're going to go into these two townships and um, and check everybody's citizenship status by the 1982 laws. These are uh, where the majority of the recently displaced have, have, are here in, in one of them. So if you've been displaced by violence, are you going to have your papers? And if you are Rohingya, you're illegal. I don't know what they're going to do with these people, but that's their situation now. So my initial question was, which one is Rohingya? I want to ask you which one is alive. Thank you.
Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.